That's true. Awesome. So I want to get started on time only because I know the discussions may or may not uh, go further than an hour sometimes. So um, first of all, thank you for being a part of this and thank you for the transparency on how we are successes and failures of investing. Um, I want to start off by each one of you just kind of introducing yourselves, um, how long you've been in the business and when you started investing. Yeah. All right. Um, I am Constance Ford. Uh, I am with the Lakes office and I got licensed uh, in real estate in 2007. So uh, late 2007, perfect timing. It was awesome. Um, and I have been an investor since 2000, which is when I bought my first uh, home with a duplex. And I uh, just kept going. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Kari Lundin, I'm from the Edina Market Center. I've been in the business 21 years. I bought my first investment property in 1993. It was a six unit and I lived in it. Um, Eric. Eric Steinbach, and I'm here in the Wayzata Market Center or Lake Minnetonka. And um, I've been in the real estate since 2001. and uh, we also bought our first home in 2000. Uh, our first next home was purchased in 2010. Awesome. Chrissy? I'm here too. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay, awesome. So I'm Christy Fellerman. Um, I am with the Otsego office. That is our hub, um, but I live in South Dakota. And um, I got into real estate full time in 99 and purchased my first home, which was a duplex um, in 2000. Awesome. Um, so I kind of sent out the, the questions. Um, I didn't get any questions back after that. So either we are ready to go with these questions or. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kind of go through the list. We're going to start out with the simple ones. Um, and I'd like each one of you to answer it in whatever way uh, you feel is appropriate. Um, and then we'll kind of go down, go down the list. So uh, why did you get into investing in real estate? Yeah. Um, I'll start with you on the next question. Okay. Perfect. Um, why did I get into it? Um, I, it took me, well, I guess it depends on what the question is. If it's investment property or uh, real estate sales. I always knew I wanted to buy investment property. Um, like literally since I was five. Um, and so first opportunity I, I could, I took it. Um, I mentioned I was 21 when I bought the duplex. And uh, I don't know how, how many of you guys remember this, but uh, back in those days, you could get what was called a no dot loan. And that's what I got. Uh, it was nine and a half percent interest. I was a bartender, uh, but I just always wanted to own real estate. Um, I, we lived in rentals when I was a little kid, um, and so it was it was really important to me. I did not want to be a real estate agent well, for a long time. People kept telling you, oh, you should get into real estate, and I was like, no, I don't think so. Um, it took me a long time to realize I could do it kind of how I wanted to. I had a really, yeah. like, a preconceived notion of what it meant to be a realtor and what I would have to do, and so um, until I learned customize it. I use it. Awesome. So since five, yeah, you've wanted to have an investment property. Yeah. Well, I wanted to own property okay. since I was five. Okay. Yeah. And so the reason that age stands out is um, when, when I was little, uh, my parents got divorced when I was two, they were in theater, which means they like, actually were like servers and cab drivers. Um, but we, uh, my parents got divorced and then my mom decided to go to law school which was really awesome, uh, but also really difficult. And yeah. we lived in this place. This, it was a beautiful Victorian house in the Wedge neighborhood. But we lived in the attic, which was unfinished except for one maid's room that was my bedroom that had like squirrels in it. It was kind of funky. But the house was owned by um, uh, a, a, like a, a couple of lawyers and they had like a law practice in there. So my mom worked for them as like a paralegal yeah. while she was going to school and then we lived upstairs and the house had like awesome architectural features and I was aware early on of like what it meant to be like the owner of the house versus like the tenant and so that's yeah. where that all kind of came together that's awesome. so how did I get is that yeah how did you get into the investing portion um well my dad was a lifelong real estate investor um 
but I didn't catch the bug until I had insomnia. And I saw a late night infomercial, Carlton Sheets, who was the Mr. No Money Down, you know, asked the agent to kick in money for the down payment, you know. <laughs> Most of his practices weren't legal, but um, in, in, in many states, <laughs> but, but he inspired me to kind of start thinking about it. And yeah. once I started thinking about it, I got the bug. I guess I had it genetically, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Eric. So I, in like 2008 or so, we were massively upside down on a property that that we had sold our first house and purchased another house and. We we're like $250,000 upside down in that house. And um, in, uh, well, through taking bold, I, I, I learned about, you know, like a personal financial statement and, or at least the concept of that. And um, at that time, I, I did, went through the exercise to, to figure out my net worth. And I figured out my net worth was massively negative, like hundreds of thousands of dollars negative. And, uh, I just remember looking at my, like trying to figure out what was going to need to happen with our current place in order for me to get back in the positive. And the best case scenario I could figure out would be that like after 10 years, I might be back to break even on that place. And I knew from looking at this, uh, this net worth statement that like that just wasn't going to do it. So uh read the blue book, millionaire real estate investor and, and figured that part out. And then I had a couple of clients who were investing in real estate and I kind of caught on to what they were doing. And that's when we purchased our first next house. Awesome. Yeah. Christy. So I guess I would say mine was kind of by chance and by necessity, how I started investing. Um, I did not grow up in a, a family that invested uh, we rented until I was in late junior high. Um, but once I got my license, uh, my degree is actually in education. So I was substitute teaching, I was waitressing, and then got into real estate. Um, once I got my license, I decided, okay, I'm going to buy a house. And uh, it was a duplex. And it helped me, it actually paid my mortgage, the rent paid my mortgage. So I was able to you know, live rent free. And I thought that was pretty awesome. So that really launched it for me. It wasn't honestly intentional for me. Um, but it helped me open my eyes to, okay, I can do this rent free. And then I've since purchased long terms and short term rentals and, um, and whatnot. So awesome. All right, Derek, I'll start with you on this next question. Um, how are you tracking the success of your investment? So I, well, I track, uh, I, I use a personal financial statement to track my net worth uh, at least monthly. I do it about the 15th of the month after we've um, made mortgage payments across the board. Um, so the principal balances go down and, and um, so I track my net worth monthly. And then um, for our individual properties, I keep a spreadsheet um, it's just a cash flow analysis. And um, as you know, as rents go up or expenses go up, I update my spreadsheet so that I'm I'm constantly aware of of what the, the cash flow looks like on the on the properties. So I'm curious uh, on that piece when you're when we talk about success of your investments, right? Are you thinking of them as a whole? Um, or do you actually take a look at them, you know, as a whole portfolio of the success or or potential failure of it, or do you pinpoint each property that may or may not be making what you need? Well, so when I go through this, I look at it and um, on my cash flows, we have like we have a, a property out here that makes two hundred and forty dollars a month, which is really low compared to the rest, and. Uh, that one is an area for improvement. We have a couple of them that are like that, that are areas for improvement. And over the years, I would say that we've either sold off low performers and then traded up to other properties. Um, but like right now, our outliers are because we have long-term tenants in them and um, I haven't uh, kicked them out or raised rent so much that they have to move out because I have like a little soft spot for them and, and it's fine. Like they're fine, they, they take care of the houses and stuff. So like 
uh, in that way, I would say that that like I'm keeping track of that on a on a monthly basis. Uh, the other thing that we do though is with our um, when we go into a property, I'm analyzing exactly what all the uh, the different numbers are um, as far as cash flow or as far as um, what does our equity look like going in and then after we've done our project and and are coming out on the back end and we have tenanted it. Um, so like through those those uh, avenues, I, I guess I'm I'm constantly tracking. That. Okay, um, let's just see. I mean. I'm, can we ask them how many um, properties? Yeah, that's what have? I was going to just, I'm going to, yeah. how many properties and what type are they? So we have 24 properties, one being our, our personal residence. Um, and the <clears throat> 23 properties consist of, uh, sorry, 24 properties consist of four condos. The rest are all single family homes. Uh, one of the condos is in Miami. Otherwise, everything else is in the West suburbs. Um, a couple a couple in Crystal, majority Plymouth, Minnetonka, Why is that a Lake Minnetonka area, he died. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have my house, a single family rental, two duplexes, a triplex, and a piece of eight commercial properties. Okay. And then how are you tracking the success of those? Well, I got to back up, right? I <laughs> I know all the lingo and everything, but I gotta dumb it down. I'm the duplex chick, right? I do everything in fat crayon. I had to start and say, uh, because I had just screwed up everything in my financial life, here's a, here's a clue. If the envelope is in your mailbox and you don't bring it in the house or open it, you still owe the money. I had to figure that out the hard way. So anyway, I had to educate myself and I had to figure out, I have, has anybody heard of the fire movement? Financial independence, retire early. All right, we, I got some head nods here. Okay, so I had to figure out what it would take for me to retire at a normal age because I was so far behind the eight ball, right? So I started with a net worth track, tracker, right? That if you do nothing else, Keller Williams has a net worth tracker. Fill it out. Don't be afraid of it. It is the most addictive thing you can do, isn't it? Completely. You get your mortgage statement and you go, oh, right? I get to put a new number in and my net worth goes up, you know, because I have these properties. Every month, my net worth goes up three grand and I didn't do anything but pay the bill, right? If you get, if you get like an adrenaline rush with it. And I had to figure out kind of what are my numbers that my FI numbers, my financial independence numbers, to figure out how much cash flow do I want where I could say to any awful real estate client I have, right? Perhaps you, we can help you, I can help you find an agent who shares your vision, right? So I, I like I like that. I like that. So, I, I, like I be no. <laughs> so I have three numbers. Here's my bare minimum number to retire or have that FU money, right? Yeah. Here's my, this would be a whole lot better. And here's my, oh, this would be awesome number, right? And I worked backwards and figured out what rate of return do I need on the money I put in at this point in my life, right? In order to make sure I hit that long-term goal. And then I figured it out once I bought those properties at those rates of return, how much cash flow were they gonna throw yeah. off, right? Yeah. So what I monitor every year, and I use a program called Stessa, it's QuickBooks with a cartoon more cartoon friendly interface for me is assets spelled backwards, totally free. And I go in and it calculates what's my rate of return on each property, but more importantly, kind of what my cash flow is. Am I hitting that number I need that property to hit to get to my financial independence goal? Is that a non-answer answer or an answer? No, that's a that's a very detailed answer. So okay. you did you did look at the questions and you, you have all the right answers. Yeah, but I, I mean fat crayon for me, sorry. So <laughs> my question to that, as you look at that, just like I asked Derek, are there ones that are performing better uh, or ones that you're like, okay, what's the next step? I think you know, in investments, a lot of times you have you have multiple ways out when you go into it, right? Mm -hmm. You can rent it, you can flip it, you can, you know, tear down, rebuild, you can do what like there's multiple ways. So if one's not performing, what do you do at that moment? Try and figure out why. Okay. Um, 
I've been pretty spot on lately. Okay. I had I had one after I sold my first one, I 1031 into a 23 unit in St. Cloud, and that was an utter disaster. And ultimately what was best for me was to just get out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I have uh, six properties plus my home, uh, five duplexes and a triplex. Um, I also use a, a personal financial uh, statement. I track my net worth uh, on at least a monthly basis. And I also have a spreadsheet, maybe the same one that you have, Derek. I got mine from uh, Robin Voorhees, actually. And so I use that to do raw numbers on each individual uh, property. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a specific amount of cash flow. So I use the the spreadsheet, you know, if I'm looking at properties, like all the time, I mean, even if it's for a client, you know, I'll pull out the spreadsheet and say, okay, if somebody puts, you know, 25% down on this duplex, like what's the cash flow going to be? What do I think it can rent for? Um, and so, you know, I mean, once I have a tenant in, those numbers don't change too much, uh, but I monitor them, obviously update them every time we have new rental rates or whatever. Um, as far as defining, uh, Success. I mean, for me, what I've been through is several permutations of investment properties over the last uh, 23 years, um, <clears throat> including two marriages. And so the most recent crop that my uh, husband and I purchased together, that was really with a, a, a thought for, for income, the future. Um, it occurred to me at some point in my mid-30s that... Um, I had no retirement, like at all. I had always been self-employed uh, pretty much. And so uh, when we decided we wanted to have a baby, I was like, oh wait, I should probably have some kind of retirement. Like, how is this gonna work? And so I got really, really like panicked. And um, the best idea I could come up with is we should buy some properties, we should buy them now so that we can have income and you know pay them off basically and have income, uh, you know, uh, that we can count on in the future. So in the in the interim, I have also started at home. Okay, uh, so you know, relax. Um, <laughs> but that was that was really the motivator. So I was looking at cash flow, and really, you know, I look at the the um, the net worth and stuff. But I mean, honestly, I don't care that much because I don't ever want to sell any places. Like I want them to get paid off um, and, as soon as possible, and uh, and have that. Awesome. Christy, you're up. All right. So same. I mean, we have our spreadsheets, of course. We track each property. We track net worth. Um, we we currently own four short-term rentals, my husband and I. We did um we have prior owned long terms. We did get out of long term about three years ago and we reinvested that into short-term rentals. So we do Airbnb VRBO. That is where our investment properties are. We also invest in new construction. So we are partnered, partnered with our builder um, doing new construction as well. So in the way of tracking, same thing, performance. Um, we kind of, when we re-looked at everything a couple years ago, we decided we didn't prefer the long-term tenant. We didn't prefer um, managing those properties, what we really, really enjoyed and where we saw really good investment and income is from the, the short-term side. So that is where all of our properties are. When you say you're investing with your builder, what does that mean? So we are outlaying money alongside of him to, uh, build, uh, model homes, um, provide opportunities for our team to sell property. Um, so we're just financially invested with him okay. so we can put up specs and models. Awesome. Derek, I'm gonna start with you on this one too. Um, are your investment properties active or passive? <clears throat> That's a great question. So, <laughs> um, I had such a hard time writing this down and I'm having a hard time even reading what I wrote. I said, I think of it as extremely time leveraged active investment. 
currently. And I say that because uh, we do manage our own properties. And um, for me, it's, uh, I, I have to find a tenant and then I have to cash, well, I guess I don't even cash checks. I just look at the app, like Venmo or whatever. So uh, my wife though does our property management and with the property management, she's working on like, uh, or dealing with uh, mechanical issues and stuff like that. So it's not 100% uh, passive, but um, it's definitely uh, more passive than active, but I, I would say. Why was that hard to write down and say? <laughs> because I think of it as a passive investment, but it's not. It, it's, it's an extremely time leveraged actor. Could it be? Of course. I could pay somebody else to do what I do. And uh, I choose not to because that it does dovetail pretty nicely with my other business, selling real estate. So it works pretty well together. How are you? I'm a hybrid. Um, okay. I have some Airbnbs as well that I have a manager for. Um, seeing all that they do, I'm glad I have a manager for it. Um, I'm, I'm not that patient. So, um, but on, on the other stuff, I mean. Okay, so only your short term, you yeah. actually. Okay. How, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. How does uh, having a manager on your short terms impact your returns versus your long terms? Um, I'm hitting the goal I had for the property. And my rate of return is three times greater than, I mean, I won't buy a property if it won't work as a long-term rental because I do not trust yeah. city or county government. Um, unless it's like, I'm, I'm looking at like the Smoky Mountains right now or someplace like that. That, that off the table in, in the Twin Cities, it's got to work as a long-term rental in case it gets shut down. My numbers as a short-term rental on it versus a long-term rental on it are three and a half times managed what they would be as a long-term. And that's so, pretty normal. Like that's pretty yeah. normal on what you can get on a short-term versus a long-term rental. So uh, if, I, if I managed it myself, it, theoretically, if I was as good at it as they are, um, it would be greater still, but I'm very confident I would not be as good at it as they are. And are those the a, a duplex like both sides? Um, it, well, side. Minneapolis just changed. My one duplex is in Minneapolis, and now one side has to be 30 days, and you can only own one short term rental in the city of Minneapolis. Um, there were fewer short term rentals in Minneapolis per capita than almost any other comparable city in the country, but we have a wacko city council. It's better now, but there's still a little bit. Um, don't get me started. <laughs> And then the others are in St. Paul, which which I know. But St. Paul, even though they're crazy on rent control, they're much more measured on short-term rentals, and you can have one per building. And you have to be careful because they put new fees and taxes on short-term versus long -term. Cares. Who cares? If I'm hitting my number, who cares? Yeah. And I'm, and I'm full constantly, and I've been very surprised that the 30-day furnished rentals are pretty full, too. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> uh, are your investments act for passive? Oh gosh, they're uh, yeah, they're they're passive until they're active. I mean, so I manage uh, my husband and I manage our three that are in Minneapolis. Um, the other three are in ones in Duluth and two are in Superior. Those are managed by a uh, property management company. So you know, I mean, when it's not turnover over time. Uh, it, Pretty, pretty simple, but it's it's not a not a passive, not completely passive. Um, I still do I do all the leasing, and lately um, I feel like I'm managing a property management company more, so it's, it's still a fair amount, of and it can be passive. Chrissy, yes, um, um, my is active. I do manage our properties. That is my role. So. Again, ours are all short term. So when I was kind of looking at it, trying to decipher how much time do I actually spend a week, I'd say, I don't know, five hours, 10 hours maybe, because I do a lot of extra stuff. So 
We are active. Um, we are actually launching a property management company, however, and I've hired my manager. So I will be training her to take over what I do um, so I can work with investors who are also um, getting into the market. Awesome. Um, this question wasn't on there. Just I saw everyone's like jaw kind of like tense when we talked about it being active. Um, I think a lot of times in wealth building, we talk about this passive income, right? So as this is a long-term end game, do you see your active investments turning into passive income at some point in time or not? Because you said you don't want to sell yours and anyone can answer this question, right? Um, but long-term, what are you going to do with that if it's still active and you want to travel or do whatever you want to do? Well, hey, that's just leverage, right? Yeah. When you, when you choose to have the leverage. So if for now, for us, I manage because that's kind of where our life is and it is conducive to where we're at um, and make great money at doing it. However, like I have found that I can build this bigger. So I am going to start leveraging my time and they will become more passive. But of course there's fees associated with that, right? Yeah, so, how, how does that affect uh, like your acquisition prices or, or how you're purchasing these properties? Um, I would say for short terms, it's different. Um, on the management side, it can range from 10% to 20% you pay a property manager, depending on what they do for you and what area you're in. Um, if you're making the income, you know, just like was what was said earlier, right? It's all about your net profit because there's so much profit in short term, um, you can leverage out management fairly easy, depending on where you're at um, and make still a healthy income. So we, our properties, we have three in Florida and we have one in the Black Hills, right? Florida is year round, it is not seasonal. So we are busy year round. So income is good. Anyone else on that? On, on how, do I plan to manage at any level in perpetuity? No. Okay. Um, my plan, as I've imagined it right now, um, having gone through losing my dad five years ago, who had all kinds of a real estate portfolio that we had to divest of or get rented out or whatever, I don't want to lose that to anybody else. Um, all the books and all the all the podcasts make it sound like give it to your kids and they'll just be so grateful. And I work with a lot of investors and generally their kids are not grateful, right? They don't want your your duplex in South Minneapolis. Just kind of what I've I've observed. So I, my intention is eventually to start doing 1031s into a Delaware statutory trust model. A Delaware statutory trust is where you 1031. So if you sell your property and you do a 1031 exchange. You don't pay capital gains tax or depreciation and capture. One of the biggest benefits of owning real estate is depreciation. So trouble is when you sell the IRS wants the depreciation you've taken back. Well, you don't you do that, you give them. I mean, I've had I've had sellers give 47% when they cash out of a 30-year investment to the IRS. So if you're accredited, right, you have a net worth of a million dollars or more outside of your home, you can 1031 into this Delaware Statutory Trust, which is just basically a whole bunch of people put their money together and buy the Mall of America. And they agree up front that we're gonna own this property. I just use that as an example. Um, for five to seven years, completely passive, and you get like a five to 7% rate of return, but it's completely passive. That's and then you only pay taxes on whatever that gain is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you yeah. can you can exchange that in perpetuity as well, but it would be completely hands off, and my heirs would just have to deal with waiting until you know the end of the agreement you had with the other investors. I'm with Kari. That's my plan. So what was that? That's always been your plan. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I was like, I thought you like. Just <laughs> <made it out. laughs> I'm like, was that actually your plan? I don't, I don't know that we have anybody that would want our properties. And like you said, or you said, like 
generally people just wouldn't even know what to do with them in the first place and um, makes more sense for us to to cut it down um, get it to the to the point where it's just a check or a payment coming into us every month and uh, when I die then the depreciation can recapture goes away and we can give whoever uh, the money is going to you know just straight money so you can also 1031 out of the out of these products too if you want to get back into something more active again, you can you can purchase another property coming out of it too. So is that your guys' exit, I mean, not even exit, kind of end strategy, right? Um, how'd you learn about that? Um, I went to the Minnesota Real Estate, I go to the Minnesota Real Estate Journal Apartment Summit every year for like three reasons. It's in January, that isn't one of the reasons. They always have a really good breakfast. If you want like free good food, go to a commercial continuing it. They have a half day panel and it's like, I don't know, six or seven CE credits. And, and the panels come and rotate. You know, you'll hear about new apartment construction and new, a lot of it's way up here, but I heard somebody speak about a Delaware statutory trust and went, what's that? And started getting educated. Yeah. How about free veg? Oh, wait, what was that called again? The Minnesota Real Estate Journal has their annual apartment summit. It's usually the first or second week of January. They have some other interesting CE too. Um, you know, if you want to know about the Rochester market, they'll have a half day CE on that. Um, it's all commercial, but you know, it doesn't hurt to have a vocabulary as a residential agent. I learned about this Delaware Statutory Trust from a client of mine. Who incidentally, it took me about eight years to convert to a client. I just was like, <coughs> like who owned all like the duplex and triplex around where I live? And this guy's name kept coming up, and I was like, I gotta be this guy. And I cold called him. I cold called him for years. And finally, finally, he uh, called me back and said, Okay, I'm ready to sell one place. The guy is 80, uh, 81 now. But he's like, I'm gonna do a 1031 exchange into a Delaware statutory trust. And I was like, That sounds amazing. What's that? And so then I learned, and I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. It's such a great idea. We might, my husband and I talked about selling one of our places to our son when it's like college time, but if he's, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how, if he wants it and if he, if he, uh, if he like <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what is this worth to sell, or what are you? <laughs> he needs to be really excited about the opportunity. For it to, for it to go. Awesome. Um, so this one might be, I know you may or may not know. Uh, what is your rate of pay for everything that you're doing with your rental properties? Derek and I had a conversation about that. Like when you, when you think of it long-term, right? We think of our return on investment, but the things that you do, or if you don't have a property management company, what is your actual rate of pay while you're doing that? Do you guys know that? I can speak to that a little bit um, on the short term side. Yes. So when I just average out, right, like what was our net profit last year? And then how many hours do I put in? So I just took it from a very base rate when I read this, this question, and I just said, okay, so if I, let's say I work 46 weeks a year, I work 10 hours a week right and i know what our profit was last year minusing out all expenses i'm at about 400 dollars an hour for managing and owning our properties for what i do yeah i, I would say that, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay um when i fill out my net worth statement i just use whatever the the uh, government says my property assessed value is. We all know that that's usually lower, right? So yeah. I feel I feel like I'm not buffaloing myself. Yeah. And when I appreciation, cash flow, tax savings, right, and principal reduction, when I add it all together, I blew what I made in real estate as a realtor out of the water in less amount of hours a week. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, last year. You know, I think it's funny um, with Christie's $400 an hour number, because as I was thinking about it, that was the number that I was thinking of. 
and I have I have no evidence to back it up whatsoever. Um, but like I said, when I was going through my stuff, I or when I was thinking about that active versus passive, it's like an extremely time leveraged active investment, and I that speaks to that uh, four hundred dollars yep. an hour. Well, and if you knew that exact number, if it was a specific number, does that allow you more control and power to leverage that out, right? Because you actually know what that is per hour, and now you are able to make a, a smart decision on, I can hire this hire this piece out. Would you agree with that, Christy? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we know what we're making, I can say, gosh, there's a lot of margin in that. And do I want to leverage it? That's wonderful. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful income, right? So maybe I don't even want to leverage it because why would I for 10 hours a week, right? But if I want to, so I could put my time into other things to grow that, then I have the margin to do that. Awesome. Um, what, I mean, we kind of talked about your exit or your end goal for the investments, um, but we didn't really talk about your strategy, right? So there's strategy to get to that. Um, who wants to start with that? What is the, what is the strategy and time frame for you getting to, to that end or exit, exit goal? Chrissy, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, my husband and I have talked about this lately, and truly when we got into the investing of the short terms, we said we want four properties. We don't want to go crazy town. Um, and so our thing would be is right now, because we have our four now, to start paying off one. So doing the Dave Ramsey, which is, I mean, we you had asked another question about like, how do we get started? I would yeah. speak to Dave Ramsey on that as well. Like, to pay off one and then to snowball into the others. Um, so we actually have four paid off assets by the time we retire in 15 years. Okay. And are they all under the same LLC? When you say pay them off uh, or, or you know, start paying one off more, um, how are you doing that? Are you just you know, uh, adding to the, to the monthly mortgage payment? Yeah. Exactly. Um, from another property or that property only? No, we, we, the plan is that we are just going to pay down in the, as a, a 15 year, actually probably even less than that, but just pay it down and then start snowballing into the second one. So. Awesome. Well, the question is, uh, <laughs> what is your investment strategy to get to the end game or the, the exit goal? My, uh, for me, um, I, I'm just fixated on the passive income number. I mean, when I hit that, then I'll decide, right? Okay. But um, I have tried to build enough reserves in each property, right? I can't touch it till I have X amount of dollars in it. And then use that money to either think about buying another property to, um, I, you know, this is a wealth building se seminar. So I wanna talk a little bit about the solo 401k and the advantage we have as being self-employed. I put, the IRS keeps raising the roof of the maximum contribution I can make, damn it. I put, this year I have to put $67,000 into my 401k, which means I have to sell X amount of properties above and beyond my monthly nut, right? Yeah. Well, why not let my short-term rentals do that, right? Because when you retire, you don't want a one-legged stool where all you have is real estate and it's not liquid, right? It's not liquid. So if you need $100,000 right now, you're at best case scenario, three months from getting it, right? By the time you put it on the market, the buyer gets financing and you close. So um, it's important to have some more liquid assets as well. Um, so I'm fully funding my 401k, which gives me added tax advantage, plus I can borrow from it as a solo 401k. If I wanna use it for rehab money, you know, on a property, I can, I can do that as well. But my goal truly is, I have a number I wanna fund that to, and I have a number in passive income. That's my exit strategy when I hit that. And if I'm gonna pay off any piece of real estate, it's my house, because I can sell that without tax consequences. So you're still using your investments as the tool that's funding whatever other investment you have. Mm -hmm. Or if 
we all have months where a closing gets delayed and we really needed that closing, right? Good to have an emergency fund, right? If you have to, it's not ideal, but yeah. it's, it, it's nice to have that if you need it, right? Yeah. So uh, our method for purchase or for properties is, is we buy properties and then we, we do a major construction project on them. So we may, uh, improve the value significantly and then we refinance and pull our money back out and move on to the next property so um what is my investment strategy i said uh, we buy at a strong value and that's like the number one thing that that we do is just buy each property right um we go into every property with multiple exit strategies um, we hold and cash flow the property. We also refinance and pull our capital back out. We trade up and then, you know, so like that's in a very basic way what we do. When we go into a property, um, I'm trying to either hold on to that property with zero money out of my own pocket when uh, the refinance of the property is complete, or uh, if we're bringing in 1031 funds, I'm trying to at least double, if not triple, my equity position in the property when we do it. So that looks something like uh, on a $600,000 house that uh, we were required to have 25% equity in, uh, I've got $50,000 of my money in and I've created, we, sorry, we have created $100,000 of equity in the property. That makes sense? Okay, and that's, yeah. that's like what we do over and over and over like that's is it usually your rehabs are you financing that out of pocket or are you how are you building that in or no we use a construction loan to to take down the property the construction loan funds uh acquisition of the property and construction cost uh and then we either use our money or credit line to fund our 20 percent down because they make us put down 20 percent of cost which is purchase price and rehab Can you repeat the question one more time? Your strategy, your investment strategy to get to your end goal. Um, just keep buying uh, within certain parameters. So we, I've uh, bought uh, a few different types of properties over the years, and uh, but most recently uh, it's just duplexes. There's the one off oddball triplex. Um, but I, uh, you know, I I dabbled with with flipping and single families and they, I didn't have as much success with those probably because of my personality and uh, not the properties themselves. But um, I've been very focused on a certain type of duplex or triplex, a uh, certain age of property. They're all um, urban. Um, it just, for some reason works for me, I think, because I always look for a property that I would be excited to live in. So if you remember the Victorian uh, story where we lived in the attic, like I loved that house so much and I, I gravitate to that type of property and I have learned that other people do too. Um, I also, uh, for, for as long as I've had uh, rental property, have rented to people with dogs. I have been bitten, uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, by that a few times, but not enough to stop me. Um, and so just repeating what works that way um, has, has been my strategy. And then I also um, have a number that I started with that I said, okay, you know, this is how much we, we spend every month to live. And here's how much I think we need to have passive income ultimately to retire. That number has, uh, I've increased that number uh, as time has gone by, um, but we've also exceeded it. And so, you know, I keep sort of moving the goal ball. I understand that. Um, but that's that's the that's the methodology that, that I use. Awesome. I think that's super natural to progress yeah. because we've done the same thing and you said the same thing. And I think it, it just becomes more and more apparent what's possible once you start operating and understand, you know, what the like what the different factors are. I'm going to ask two more questions and uh, if there's questions uh, in the audience or on Zoom. Um, where, you know, everyone wants to know where to get the money, right? Um, 
what if I have no money? How do you how do you get started with that? And where can you look, or where did you look, um, or did you have a nest egg already set up for that? I can start with that. Okay. Well, so there was this no doc loan back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got. Um, I don't think they have those anymore. But uh, we have. I have used. Um, uh, Conventional financing, that's mostly what I do. So yeah, I had to you know, save up 25% down for a duplex. Uh, a couple of times we used a home equity line of credit against our home for the 25% down for the conventional financing for the investment property. We also have used, um, uh, what do you call it? Hard money financing. Uh, we worked with Pine Financial Group on I think three occasions. Um, one of which worked amazing. Like we literally had no money out of our pockets at all and like got like thousand back even with fix up. Others didn't weather that well because of the appraisal, uh, but still was less, we were at less hand than 25%. Um, and so that that worked out really well. And, and uh, I would definitely use that again. But now, you know, we got to a point where like our, our properties do cash flow pretty well. And so I feel, confident that we can continue doing 25% down if that's the best option, you know what I mean, most affordable option. Um, so yeah. If I were just getting started, I would um, owner occupy just like I did. Mm, yeah, yeah okay. sorry. Three and a half or 5% down, depending on your income. Um, a little bit of the BRRRR strategy, which buy, renovate, rent, um, refinance, repeat, right? So move in to something that maybe you can put a little sweat equity into, right? Rent it out for more money, refinance, take your money out. You know, um, so you can qualify, you can start with a 5% down loan, do that first, because you can only have one FHA loan at a time, right? So then 18 months later, go get your FHA loan, now you've got two with eight and a half percent down. That's, pro that's what I recommend to my clients. Hey, that is, Oh, I would start. So you have to you have to hit income qualifications, but there's a five percent down loan program for a duplex. Um, and if you make that, I mean, you can't make more than a certain amount of money. Move in, you know, renovate it. Eighteen months later, or whatever their restrictions are, now you qualify for an FHA loan. You did in the beginning, but you can't use the five percent down loan second. You have to use it first, right? So do the five percent. And then three and a half percent, and that's all. And also, Dave Ramsey, right? I don't agree with a lot of what he said, but I have developed the envelope system with my business checking. Um, I have a whole bunch of savings accounts. It drives my bank crazy. But the minute I get a check, I have percentages I put in every account: taxes, four hundred one k, you know, um, investment. That kind of thing, right out, right off the top, like the minute it hits the account, because otherwise I'll spend it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I could go back and do it all over again, I think I would, I would, I would just buy a duplex and owner occupy half and and rent it out. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's probably right for pretty much everybody. I, I, and you know, whatever the circumstances are, they are what they are. And, and for as long as you're there, and, and certainly when I was a younger person, like I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have cared at all. Um, I, the, the way that I would recommend for other people to do it is just go out and buy your next personal property and rent out your existing property. And, um, you know, we did that. And I know we, I think we had to have like six months of reserves for both properties. And, um, which like it is its own thing because we bought the next one and then that worked so well, we bought another next property three months later. And that one was like, like it just required a whole lot more trouble. But I think the thing like, where do you get the money? Um, I think you need to be exposed to how other people are getting money. And then you need to start talking to people and bankers and if you're not getting the right answer you're looking for, then you need to talk to more bankers and different bankers and different types of banks. And don't let, uh, don't let a construct, uh, conventional uh, financing like wall stop you because um, like for us, uh, we, we ran into that uh, conventional finance wall and like 
really the next option is commercial loans. And I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll give us money for like whatever we want to buy. Like as long as, as long as it appears to make work on paper or as long as it, yeah, as long as it appears to work on paper and I have the money to fund it, they'll give me like, or they'll give us whatever. So, you know, like we've proven that we can operate them, so. Christine, do you have anything different? Um, I would say kind of in the same in the same sense here, but um, going back, you know, twenty years, whatever, when we were doing the HELOCs, the no income, you know, um, financing, we don't have that now. But in my opinion, you have to be kind of careful and do things semi by the book. So it got a lot of people in trouble doing the creative financing, at least for us it did, uh, when the downturn happened. So I would say a good place to start would be, I mean, just looking at your financial picture and where are you at now, getting your credit in line, getting your debt in line. So like the Dave Ramsey idea, if you're just starting out or if you're new in real estate or you're starting over, we went through that twice and we taught it and it, I agree, I don't agree with all of it, but really looking at your money and how your money can work for you and living within your means when you're starting is important. So buying owner occupied, that's awesome. Um, like uh, the, you know, like a duplex where you can make the money. Um, but I just, I think you have to get your money in line first and get your credit in line first and then look at investing and not jump too fast into investing um, before your whole picture is, is in line. And short-term rentals for us, that's been an awesome place to invest. So again, finding places where you know what the rules and regs are for short terms. Not everywhere can you do it. Not everywhere is it solid. If there's not rules in place already, um, there will be. So there's a lot of risk going into a place that doesn't have rules. Um, so finding, if you're gonna get into the short-term market, you need to find a place that you know what you're working with. You know you can do it. You know what properties qualify. You know how many nights you can rent. You, you have the full picture before you jump into a short term. Awesome. Um, last question is, what, uh, what's one question you'd ask an agent uh, to inspire them to invest? I'll start. It, I don't know that it's a question. I didn't phrase it like I was on Jeopardy. I, um, I know it <laughs> does not follow directions well. Um, I said, if you have interest in earning money disproportionate to your effort or time, explore real estate investing. Who's say it again? If you have interest in earning money disproportionate to your effort or time, ex explore real estate investing. And I thought about that about three weeks ago because I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways to give the blue book, the millionaire real estate investor, I'm trying to figure out ways to give it to my nieces and nephews. And I know if I give this to them, they're going to be like, no, we just got done. Like specifically for like as a graduation gift. Yeah. Right. They're like, no, like we, we just got done reading all the books that we ever need. Like, no, if you want to earn money disproportionate to your effort, read this. I mean, and that's it. would ask something like what are you what are you passionate about that you could give your energy to that well is unlikely to ever earn you money that if you didn't have to worry about earning money that you, what would you dedicate yourself to like is there some you know cause or some charity or something and I'm really interested in like sustainable food systems like I want to go to Latin America and like study what the world food program is doing to help people you know not become uh, climate migrants and you know, I'm probably not going to get like a good job doing that, but if I can set up, you know, a financial scenario where I don't have to worry about that, then I can go and help people. So what's that thing in your life? 
I'm far more motivated by fear. <laughs> um, I just would ask people, how, how do you intend to fund your retirement? Yep. I, I came from another brokerage and there was an agent in the office that was in her 80s and she was still selling. And I heard secondhand that um, something had happened to her and her husband. They had set money aside for retirement and lost it all. And she had to sell. And I think about that all the time. And I don't want to be that. Um, you know how we are self-employed. There's no 401k. There's no pension. There's no nothing. If we don't take control of it, we will be hurt. And she was a lovely lady. I, yeah. you know, I'm not. I don't want to say anything disparaging in that way. And I want to tell you, I gave my niece and nephews, rich dad, poor dad, for Christmas one year, knowing they wouldn't read it. <laughs> they had till New Year's to read it, and if they read it, I gave them each 50 bucks, but they had to pass a quiz. <laughs> One of them read it, and he's the one who's probably going to be an entrepreneur. So, can't win them all, right? Just plant the seed. Can't win them all. <laughs> the 80 20 principle. Right, right. <laughs> 80 20. He'll support the other one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't forget that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chrissy, how about you? I have, I have the same thing. What's your retirement plan? Because we're self employed, I think it's easy to get into the hustle and not think about how am I going to fund retirement so I can retire and so I can do those things that I am passionate about if I want to I can make choices for myself if I have a retirement plan so how are you going to retire awesome do we have questions yeah we do <laughs> I have Kevin. Question. Uh, when it goes, so I get like, we have in real estate, we have people that are just coming into real estate for the first time, right? And this is kind of their first career. And then we have people that have transitioned from other careers into something where maybe they've had some retirement stuff built up, or maybe they own a home and have some equity in that. What have your guys' experience been, or, or what do you think of personal leverage like what have you leveraged on your mortgage in order to do this what have you leveraged in some of your other spot where what's what's your wisdom in that i can speak to that a little bit um i've made sure i have a home equity line i have a line of credit an unsecured line of credit i have a good relationship with a couple of commercial bankers um i have the ability to borrow from my 401k and I have touched none of it. Um, looking forward, I'm not an economist and I hope I'm wrong, but I feel like something's changing. And I put all those things in place because I wanna be in an opportunity or in a position to take an opportunity if it presents itself, but not automatically put myself in a precarious position. Is that so you're ready, you haven't used it, but you're ready when the timing, if the timing should change. Any other questions, Jeff? Uh, just a question around maybe getting started. So if you're getting started, would you, have you guys ever considered like maybe if, assuming it's the right partner, starting with the right partner just to get started and get some money rolling? Or would you, would, would someone starting off be better off waiting until the time is right that they can take on their, their own? The right partner. I divorced my first partner. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what kind of partnership are we talking about here? All in. All in. I mean, Sorry, I mean right my day. Faster, maybe, maybe a better way of saying it. I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I personally think, uh, I don't know that I would get into it with the partner right away. Um, I mean, we, we've considered it on, on a couple different things and and it just hasn't been a path we've chosen. Um, I, I really strongly believe that we all, I, I mean, in this business, we all can make enough money to do whatever we want. And I mean, re selling real estate, right? So if that means uh, sell your tail off and don't spend money for six months or a year, then maybe that's what it takes. Or, and I, I, uh, I, I come from like a, a spot where I've seen this uh, condition in my rentals where uh, our, our tenants a lot, most of our tenants don't park in the garage. 
and they don't park in the garage because the garage is full of crap that they buy. And the garage is full of the crap that they buy because the house is full of the crap that they buy and they're currently using. And the underlying theme is they just spend a lot of money on stuff, right? And because of all that stuff, they don't have the, the ability to, to go out and purchase a home. And, and like, it's like it's this recurring theme that I see. So like, I really believe that if you're going to do it responsibly, I would go and do it on your own first. And I would, I would just start with like my first or my next first, like personal property, you know? Yeah. I, I would 1000% echo that. And maybe because I've been there, done that and borrowed against property and bought on HELOCs and all of that, right? And then the downturn happened in 08 and I was part of that. So that's when Dave Ramsey, that came into our world. And if I think exactly what you just said there, like we can hustle, hustle for a year, make the money and do it on your own. I would totally echo that because if you're going into a partnership, you better have a really, really clear picture of what that looks like in a really good exit plan. So for me, I would say the exact same thing, just hustle, do it right. Don't spend beyond your means, but absolutely set yourself up to invest because we're in real estate and that's what we know super well. So invest in real estate. If you're in real estate, you should be investing in real estate. Well, and isn't that going to cost more anyways, when you, when you bring on an experienced partner, it's going to cost you more on your ROI normally, right? Yeah, yeah. You're going to, then the partner is going to want more than what you get. Well, and, and if you think about it, I mean, you have to talk to the banker about what's appropriate, right? If FHA is three and a half percent down and the payout is 2.7, right? And you could apply your 2.7 towards the down payment. You've got yeah. to come up with 0.8, right? Come on, go go pick up aluminum cans in the ditch for point eight and take them to recycling. Right? Okay, I love that. Our and first that next, our next that. first property <laughs> took cost me like five grand out of pocket. Yeah. I mean, it was like because of because of just that. So yeah, you could find an elderly seller. I've certainly had many of them. They don't. They, if in a perfect world, they wouldn't cash out, right? Because they're going to pay that taxes. They might carry a contract for a while. Yeah, it's it's a rare bird, but you have to be going on listing appointments to, to meet those guys, mm -hmm. right? So like point eight, right? Sell something in, in right. the tenant's garage. Right. Yeah. You know, no one. Uh, <laughs> Just take it and sell it. There you go. So, <laughs> it's true. Hearing Christy say uh, hustle for a year, it made me yeah. that I think I actually had to hustle for like two and a half years. Because first I recognized the problem in 08 and we weren't able to purchase until August of 2010. And the, that lag period was I had to earn the money and then I had to show the tax, uh, like yep. show it on taxes. And then I think I had to like the next year then continue earning to the point where I had the money and I had the taxes that I was finally able to get the, the loan that like moved us on to our next property. Is that when you started? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what a good year, 2010. Yeah. Right. Any other yeah. questions? This might be really dumb. Um, no such thing. Okay, so when you can I don't know what passive and active means, by the way, but when you cash flow on a property, so say you're making $500 a month, what do you do with that $500 a month? <laughs> this is recorded, by the way. <laughs> like, do you put it into like a specific like account? Do you break it up? Do you pay? Like, what do you, I? What do you do with it? Oh, so you can save it, spend it, or invest it, right? Okay. Um, I have each of my properties has its own savings account, and I won't touch the money till it hits a number I set for myself in that savings account, and then. In my case, I put it in a 401k, right? Or I, I say, I'm gonna, I've got enough in each of my properties accounts to go buy another property. Yeah. You definitely need to be having a fund for that property because you're gonna have fixes, you're gonna have updates, right? You don't wanna, what you don't wanna do is buy real estate and spend all the money that you make. 
That's what you don't want to do because that will get you in a big pickle. So you want to have a, a fund set up for if the AC goes out, the furnace goes out, do you need a roof? You need a hot water heater, right? You have to save money for that property. And that might be saving it like you might invest in other properties and continue a whole fund, but you have to think about that when you are investing in real estate, that properties need, they need updates. You fund that, fund that first, yeah. you assuming, yep. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Do you have a minimum that you guys have in each property fund? I've got like, I've got like six months of um, mortgage payments and then plus like a roof, right? Or a fill in the blank. I mean, I I had an 18 month old dishwasher just die last week, you know, and I could just write a check for a new one. So we we started with a uh, uh, ten thousand uh, dollar. We would we would never let the account go. So we have one account because we started. We didn't we didn't want to have all the all the accounts because you should have the separate accounts for all the properties. And I I hate going to the bank and having those conversations. So I was like, how can we not do that? So we started a property management company so we can put the property funds together. Um, but uh, but yeah, in the beginning, the goal was you know never go below ten thousand. We're over that now. Uh, we haven't set like a new ceiling. But um, but yeah, for like we don't we just it just sits there basically until we have to fix something. But properties that have problems where <laughs> we continue to have things to be, to be fixed. So someday we'll get to the point where we'll put some money in a savings or something like that. But right now, roofs and things like that. Awesome. Uh, no, that's a question. And you maybe hit it, but LLCs, are they all in their own LLCs? Are they partner in the one? You said a property management company. I don't know how that works. We have, so I'm very, very fortunate that my mother is an attorney uh, and she helps me out a lot. Uh, she does real estate one of her helps. So she, we use conventional financing for most of our properties. And so you can't technically, you're not supposed to deed the property into an entity. It's supposed to be in your personal name. She set up for us uh, something called a business trust, which is, seems like it's kind of shady maybe it's like not a trust but it is a trust but um but yeah if you don't have that uh i think you if you're going to do an llc you have to have commercial financing right mm -hmm. yep refinance the conventional into commercial ideas or do you well why would you do that i mean because the money is so much cheaper well it depends i guess you have to evaluate the options and and what you know how much does the money cost i guess i learned that the hard way um, the, the thing about commercial is a, it's more expensive and it's got a shorter amortization schedule. So it's harder to make like a duplex cash flow. So, um, buy in your personal name. And then once it's seasoned a little bit, quick claim into an LLC, theoretically you could trigger the due on sale clause. Yes. But I haven't ever heard of that actually happening. Right. That's so, exactly how we were counseled as well. The 30 year amortization and the lower interest rate, and then protect yourself with an LLC. You also can do it with an umbrella policy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yes, definitely. Umbrella policy. Any other questions? I mean, I think we could go on like all day. Uh, my question was so, do you actively market as an investor, or do you search the MLS? Like, where are you find, or is it just like things are coming to you as you're working in real estate? Can I answer? You answer the night one. Answer. Listing appointments. Listing appointments. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Like, hey, how about so I could list your house for this? I think it'll sell for this. Or if we take away all the commission, you could just sell it to me for this. What do you think? How many? We're all done today. How many properties have you bought like that? Two. Successful. Okay. I've attempted more. Okay. Than that. <laughs> Derek. Uh, numerous. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Quite yeah. a few. Like, yeah, okay. the, like, yeah. They, I, I don't even know if More I can, than 10? I don't even consider them listing appointments. I consider them like buying appointments <laughs> like, when they come in like the right way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I've, okay. I've purchased two that way. Okay. Christy? I have never purchased that way. And I think it's an awesome way to do it, but especially with our short terms, that's not even an option for us because of where we invest. So, but I think it's, it's smart, of course. So that answer your so, question? It's Christy. Oh, really? so, the, okay. so the other, so 
some of them come from that. Where are the are you actively searching on MLS? Are you door knocking? Are you actively marketing as an investor? The one I purchased on the MLS was in a location that they hardly ever come up, and it's a location that um, if I retired and downsized, I would want to live. So okay. I I I was the buyer. I represented myself, which is in an emotional purchase not a good idea. But um, <laughs> Maybe a, maybe to frame that, how are you getting those listing or buying appointments? Are you sending letters? Are you cold calling? Are you, like, what is the strategy to get those? Are you doing it through your sphere? For me, it's um, partially my branding. Okay. And partially, um, one of them was I learned probate. Okay. And um, I do a lot of cold calling and I went to the court to, look at the probate records and I have to kind of cross reference and go, is that a duplex or whatever? And I'm like, why do I know that name? Why do I know that name? And I had my laptop and I pulled it up. And I'm like, well, that's the guy that used to swear at me all the time. <laughs> so I, I reached out to his representatives and it turned out he was a hoarder um, and they lived out of state. So that, that's how I got that one. The other one was I had represented a seller and the person who bought her uh, apartment building um, called me because she wanted to sell her triplex down the street. Okay. Yeah. I think I bought, I think I bought four properties off of MLS in the last year and they're, they're out there. I mean, you know how overpriced everything is, but right. Um, and yet they're still out there. Um, and I think yeah, uh, at least three of those were all in multiple offers too. So writing like a good, clean, easy offer for somebody. Um, and all of those properties needed work too. But otherwise, um, same, I, like we mail and, and I've got agents that uh, that bring me properties too. The office has been great about sending me properties, like just opportunities. Because not every property, like, you know, not every seller wants to sell an MLS or maybe 10 or it's not realistic. So. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, so Kari, you, you mentioned you're ready for what's next, right? So as investors who own properties in our current market, and what are your feelings? Are you, are you waiting for that? Are you anticipating and excited about that? Are you going, oh, I'm gonna watch my net worth go down during that time? What, what feelings do you have as we might, as we are shifting out of this market, maybe into something different? I don't think we're going to 2008. I don't know what everybody else is thinking. I just think that buyers are gonna have a little bit more equal footing. Um, I think that the churn rate is gonna slow down. And so there'll be opportunity that way as sellers become impatient. And what was the rest of the question? So are you, uh, do you see that as opportunity? Do you see, oh, my net worth's gonna be going down? Yeah. How do you see that? All of the above, all of the above. Um, but recognizing being so indoctrinated in Real estate has cycles, right? Just like the stock market has a cycle. It's not permanent. And I, <clears throat> I heard Gary say, Gary Keller say on stage, family reunion or something, you know, he'd never made a, a bad real estate investment that time didn't fit, right? So if you can just hang on long enough, it'll be a great real estate investment. We're just, you just might be in the wrong quarter of the cycle, it'll change. You know, on like an annuity, uh, our real estate investments, like re uh, residential rentals um, are tied to the cost of living. And our, um, our expense to own them is fixed or set, at least in, in most cases, maybe it's for 30 years, but in a lot of cases, you know, in, in five, 10 years or whatever, as a, on a commercial loan. So if our expenses are fixed and the um, cost of living, I tend to believe that that's gonna continue to go up and it's just gonna get higher. Whether that means there's uh, higher rents, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I would bank on that, but I feel pretty confident that uh, the cost of living is going to just get more and more expensive for people. So that does mean like in that way, I'm, I'm protected against the inflation piece. Um, when the net worth goes down, I, I mean, that's going to suck because I don't want to see that when I look at it every time. Um, and it'll be great when it jumps back up. And I guess I kind of just have this belief that 
that three and a half percent, three and a half to five percent, like the long term appreciation number, that's going to be there. And it might take two years to get back to it. It might take five or 10 or whatever. And yet, like the last couple of years is a perfect example. Like we caught up and, and now we're, we're like going gangbusters and like 15, 15% appreciation on a pretty decent sized real estate portfolio is like, I don't know, like uh, staggering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or not staggering. It's just like right. more than more than I uh, more than I would have believed it would have been worth, right? Anyone else? All right. I have a question. Okay. Right. So I think maybe this is more for you, Derek. So in the conventional market, you can have a maximum of ten properties in your personal loan lane, and so there's two you and your wife. So there's two of you. So do you have have you guys maximized that, or do you strictly stick to commercial loans, or what do you do? We have five conventional loans, and I think even one of those is maybe like it's kind of like a special conventional loan. Like it, I think it it kind of like is conventional, but it was not like normal um, because it was this condo. <laughs> Great explanation. No, super <laughs> 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 Um, at a certain point, the conventional loans just became really cumbersome to try to work with. And uh, so like last year, when the special conventional loan, when the, the conditions came back for them to approve the loan, uh, they asked for uh, mortgage statements, tax statements, leases, and bank statements for our properties and it's you know 20 20 some properties i mean it took me like a day and a half to pull everything and i i'm i consider myself like pretty organized with that stuff and then so i sent it in and of course like they look at it all and then they have questions on all of it and i mean it's just not feasible especially if, like if we were going to continue doing that you know four or five times a year or something or whatever it, it just wouldn't be functional so for that reason, we started going with our commercial loans. And you'd mentioned like when you go to refinance, you had a problem with an appraisal. And we we had worked out conditions with our banks that um, that they would use our future value appraisal from our initial construction loan rather than reappraising the property. They would send somebody out to make sure that the work was done, but they weren't coming out to reassess the value because we got stung by that. Like, numerous times where the appraisal came in low or um you know like there was at that time there were still like bad comps out there and you can't dispute a, a not a bad comp or or like just low sales like and you can't dispute a low sale when you see it on an appraisal report it, a low sale is a low sale and if it's two blocks away you can't say well that one's yeah that one's not a good one you want to look at the good ones you know like they wouldn't do it so we just had to like uh, cover those out of pocket at that time, which, you know, that really slows down the mechanism. Yeah. So, I mean, I would continue getting con conventional loans if I could, but it's just too much work. The paperwork does get overwhelming. We did two 1031 exchanges last year on the documents. Yeah. You're an underwriter's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on Zoom or in person? They don't, they don't even know what to do with it. Yeah. Anyone on Zoom have questions? All right. Well, I want to say thank you. I'm guessing that everyone here is incredibly impressive with you guys have all been doing um, and what you continue to do. So thanks again for your time. Thanks for asking us. I didn't even get through all of them. It was a lot here. Another hour. Right? We're just trying to get out of our